I am so excited for this video because a month ago I launched my freelance media business. It has been a wild ride, an incredible journey, and I'm just gonna cover dozens and dozens of useful things if you're considering starting a freelance business, or if maybe you've already started a freelance business, you'll find things that you resonate with in this video. I have spreadsheets, I have data, and I'm gonna show you all of it in this video. My name's Nathan LaValle, please subscribe, follow, and like the video. So the first thing I wanna share with you is that I've worked 12 full days. It's been four weeks now, and I'm working Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. So I haven't even had what would be a full-time schedule. I've just had three days a week. Over those past four weeks, and a little bit before that, because I was working on some of this ahead of time, I have accomplished 15 of what I'll call startup tasks. Now these are not associated with directly meeting with a potential client, or uh, giving a sales pitch, or creating a proposal. These are related to things necessary just to get a business going in the first place. So I'm just gonna read through these. I'm gonna tell you some insights on these. The first one is I set up my business model. Now this was invaluable. I sat for weeks before I actually launched the media business and I just thought about how am I gonna provide value to businesses? What services am I gonna provide? And so I sat there and I just, in a note, typed pages and pages and pages and developed this business model. Now the second thing I did was I structured my pricing model. Essentially I started by saying how much money do I want to make per hour in this business, realistically. Now if you're just starting out, that number is going to be lower than this. I have about a decade of experience doing videography, I'll talk about that more later. But I determined for my business, I wanted to be making $250 an hour. And so with my business model laid out, all the different services I was going to offer laid out, I made estimates of how much time it would take me to provide at various levels of retainer packages within those different options. And then I set a price. Now, the somewhat complicated thing is that I devised a credit system to make this make sense to me. Now, for a lot of business owners, when I walk in and visit with them, I'm not explaining the entire credit system. I'm making it very simple. This is what you get, this is how much it costs. But if you wanna look on my website, I have just laid out exactly how I priced all the different options that I provide with my media business and I have prices at various levels. So for example, if I were to do for a business 12 social media posts per month, I was estimating that that was gonna take me a certain amount of time and then I was coming back and saying, okay, I wanna make this much per hour, and so I priced it accordingly. Now, it's not exact, I made some things be round numbers, so it was a little bit simpler, but that was the basics of how I did this. And I made sure that there wasn't one service, for example, where the customer was getting ripped off. I didn't want it to be where I'm charging $3,000 to develop a website, and I'm just gonna drag and drop a template and tweak some details, and it's gonna take me an hour. That's unfair. I don't have that much value to provide to businesses, but, I also wanted to make sure the opposite wasn't taking place where there's something that's gonna be super time intensive and I've priced it too low. So that number, 250 an hour, has been super, super valuable in my mind as I'm visiting with business owners and they're asking me questions, I wanna do this, this, and this, how much is that gonna cost? And I can kinda of come back and say, okay, some quick calculations, okay, it's gonna cost this. Now that pricing model, I specifically keep that for retainers. If I'm doing a single project, I'm gonna price it higher, more like 500 an hour. Like I mentioned before, I made a full list of all the services that I offered, and I thought strategically here, what can I realistically provide that's high quality and that's gonna benefit businesses? Everything from audio production, to videography, to photography, to web development, to doing branding, makeovers, live event coverage, I mean, just all kinds of different things. You can again view that on my website, which I'll link down below. Not trying to sell anything there on the website, but it has all of these things split out so you can see what that looks like. Now the fourth thing, I set up a sole proprietorship. A sole proprietorship is a type of business that is one individual working. Now in addition, I can set up what's called a doing business as or a fictitious name. So I set up my business to be called Bright Valley Media and I had to register that with the state that that was a fake name so I could do business as a sole proprietorship. Now later down the line, I might incorporate and turn into an S Corp or an LLC, but for now, a sole proprietorship is fine. The one thing you should know is that with a sole proprietorship, if you damage something and someone sues you, you are gonna be personally liable. So you need to make sure that you secure insurance for your business, professional liability insurance. It's not that expensive. It's like 30, 40, 50 dollars a month. Then I created my website. Now I wasn't planning on doing this until later on in the month, but it ended up being about week two. And it was because I had to send someone a website because it was going to be being shown to someone who's in the industry and frequently hires people like me to do work. So I needed to get that done. And I just 
I slaved away for days getting that done. I sat in a coffee shop and knocked out four hours here, four hours here the next day while making sure to keep things going with the business as well. So I created my website. Um, just some rapid fire stuff. I used WordPress. I used Hostinger to purchase the hosting. And I think it came out to something like 150 bucks for three years or something like that. So it wasn't ridiculously expensive. Now I also use Generate Press instead of just the built-in tools. So Generate Press allows me to create a professional website and it has lots of built-in templates, other cool things like easy ways to tweak the header, footer, colors, fonts, without having to do a bunch of coding or without having to install a bunch of different plugins. I just need Generate Press. So that's been great. I've loved using that both for my website for the business and for my nonprofit that I'm running. The seventh thing is I cut a show reel. I made a compilation of a bunch of work that I've done. I actually used some of the free videos I did over the last month in that show reel, but also stuff from previously, music videos I had shot or things from YouTube videos that looked pretty good. And I cut that together into a several minute video. Now, it's important to note here, okay? You don't need a ton to create a show reel. You need a small selection of work that if someone views, they're gonna go, oh, they can shoot high quality video. Now, later on as I do more work, and as I'm doing more professional lighting, I'm gonna probably create a new show reel because my work's gonna elevate to a new level. But for now, I just pieced together the best of everything I had into a short two or three minute video. That's linked on my website and it's also something that I can send out to a customer if they're saying, how do I know that you can create professional videos? Well, here's the evidence of that right there. I also just went ahead and created social media accounts for my business, Bright Valley Media. I didn't want someone to take that, even though I'm not planning on really launching into social media all that much just yet. I'm using my personal Instagram to post behind the scenes of doing video shoots, to post these kinds of things. So make sure again to follow, I'm not trying to sell on my personal social medias, but later down the line, I will probably utilize the Bright Valley Media social media pages that I went ahead and reserved for myself. So that's something you wanna do before you start publishing out your name because someone could swoop in if they're trying to be a jerk and they could take that. So that's another thing that I did. I have this as number nine, I made business cards. Now, something I'll just say, I waited too long in the process to make business cards because I had to walk into dozens and dozens of businesses as I was waiting for those cards to get shipped to me and I had to say I don't have a business card when they asked me for one. So I should have done that earlier. That's one thing I'll just say is right off the bat, once you figure out the name, you figure out you know kind of the industry uh, and you have all the information to make a business card, the website, the phone number, you should go ahead and create those business cards and get them shipped to you so you have them on the first day that you're gonna do prospecting. Now, it's kind of like creating the boat and sailing it down the river at the same time because you know, I ordered those business cards with the domain name. All I had done was register that domain through Hostinger, but I hadn't actually created the website. So I knew I was gonna have to do that before I started passing out business cards. And it all just kind of came together at the same time where I'm like, okay, I gotta finish a bunch of this stuff right now because my business cards are here. Now for what I did, I ordered two different business cards. One that was very simple, just had my information, the cheapest type of paper. And then I also ordered some very professional, thicker paper with glossed text on the front business cards. And basically I hand out those cheap business cards when someone says, ah, the owner's not in, uh, you, can, you can leave a business card. So those are cheap. When I'm actually visiting with an owner and I know that it's getting into the hands of the person who is gonna be the decision maker, I give them that nicer business card. The 10th thing I did was I created my first contract. Now I outlined, you know, from top to bottom, all the different stipulations of that contract. I'll link it below, feel free to take that use it if you'd like to and replace the header to be your own. I am not a lawyer, so I'm not giving legal advice, but I consulted some other YouTubers that had done this and have been doing different marketing and media retainers, and I kind of pulled the best of all that into one place. And I made that contract so that when I actually got before someone who was prepared to sign one, I would have that ready. So that first contract was finished a week before I landed my first business owner as a, as a client. The 11th thing, by the way, not in any particular order, is I purchased several different software. So I purchased a subscription to a music library. I'm not gonna throw it out right now, the name of it, because I'm not 100% sure that I like it yet, but we'll see, might turn into a recommendation. Secondly, I got a client management software, HoneyBook, 
super popular. It allows me to do charges, to send contracts, signatures, although for now I'm signing physical contracts with business owners. And then third, I got Loomly, which allows me to schedule posts into the future for businesses. Now there have been a few little hiccups about actually doing that for my first client. If you'd like a video about that, I'd be happy to share just some of the steps that it's taken to get that up and running. It's been a little bit complicated, but so far it's working out okay. And then fourth, uh, not a subscription, but an app. I got the app called CAD Rage on my phone. This lets me take pictures of various locations and plan out shoots. And the reason that that has been so good is as I'm driving around town and I'm seeing what could be a good filming location, I'm taking pictures of it and it gets geotagged. So I have a huge, huge collection of various locations, which is how I knew about this location right here. I hiked out my gear and here we are filming uh, with, you know, equipment. And then finally I got Shot Designer because I wanna do some behind the scenes breakdowns of the various different lighting setups that I've done. I have one posted for this shot and this shoot that I'm doing here. You can check that out on my Instagram if you'd like. Number 12, and this one is fun and not fun. I purchased a ton of equipment. Now I'll just get right to the number. I spent about $7,000 over this first month securing equipment. I already had a bunch of equipment, so it might cost more if you're starting with less than I had originally. I had a camera, I had a handful of lenses, I had some old tripods, just kind of some minimal video equipment. But knowing that I was gonna be going in and doing this regularly, I wanted to upgrade several different areas. I wanted to upgrade my pro audio, I wanted to upgrade to an actual cinema camera that was gonna allow me to shoot without it overheating, which is a risk with the camera I'm shooting on now, the Sony a7 IV. So I got an FX3. I also got lighting. Lighting is something that I had never used before. <laughs> I had used cheap lighting, like just a lamp, but I'd never actually used pro video lighting. So I got a ton of video lighting, and I've been really impressed with the quality of the stuff that Neewer is putting out. Um, a lot of people talk bad about it. So far, it's working out great for me. And it's a fraction of the cost of what a more expensive brand would be. And then finally, um, I got a ton of stuff for rigging. So I got C stands, I got these small stands, I got boom poles, uh, I got clips for hanging things. Uh, I mean, just tons of boring stuff, but stuff you need to be able to do video work. <laughs> so I spent about $7,000. Now, I should mention I created a spreadsheet and I'm tracking all of my business finances in that spreadsheet because when I do my taxes, the things that I've spent for my business the valid purchases that I've spent for my business are gonna be things that I actually can deduct from my income. So essentially, spending $7,000 means that the first $7,000 I make will not be taxed on my income. That's how I understand it anyways. Again, not a CPA, just a videographer and a media professional. Now, I would share, I probably have a bit of a different business philosophy than a lot of people on this sort of a thing. My thinking is that if I need it, and I can afford it without going into debt, I will buy it. And so I've been very liberal with saying, do I need that? Yes, I do need that. I'm gonna need that. If not right this moment, when I get to doing this type of shoot or this type of work, would it be nice to have now for the work I'm doing? Yeah, it'd also be nice to have now. So I'm gonna buy it. And I've just allowed myself to do that. Now I'm not making tons of stupid purchases, but I'm not running a super fiscally conservative business model where I say, we're not spending anything, we're just gonna make it with what we have. I'm very willing to upgrade equipment and to shell out a couple thousand dollars to vastly improve my workflow now and get things that I know I'm gonna have to have later. So that's kind of my philosophy uh, as it's come to spending. Now the 13th thing I already alluded to this is I created some spreadsheets for my business. One was for tracking finance. Another one was gonna be for tracking the work that I did with my retainer contracts because I wanna know how many hours I'm spending so I can validate my business model. I wanna make sure things are priced properly. They might be priced too high, they might be priced too low. And so I'm tracking my hours. I'll break that down towards the end of this video as well, how much I've been spending actually doing work. And then uh, 14, I created Obsidian templates and data view pages. That's a nerdy thing. And if you're not into Obsidian, it probably makes no sense. But basically, I created templates for when I meet a new business owner and it, it seems like a good business. I'm inputting that data into a sheet with properties. It's a 
whole nerdy thing. And then I have another note that actually pulls and, and scrubs my entire note system and pulls in every single business that I've created that sort of sheet for. I can sort it by how receptive they were. I can sort it by the last time I visited with them. I'm not actually sure if I'm gonna use this because what I found is it kind of slows down my prospecting and I'm not sure if it's worth it to slow down my prospecting as much as I would need to to keep this up to date. So we'll see, that's gonna evolve as time goes on. The final thing I did, number 15, is I set up two calls with people who are ahead of me in the same style of business that I'm running. So one was with a professional marketer and I just had a 30 minute call where I picked his brain and I asked questions about doing Facebook and Google ads and he shared some super valuable information. And then another one was with someone who I had talked to previously who had shared his whole business model with me, kind of like I'm doing now. And uh, after I'd started in the business for a little bit, I set up another call so I could pick his brain, ask him more detailed and specific questions than the previous time. And he's again, several steps ahead of me, running a very similar business to the type of business I'm working. He's in the Dallas area. I'll put his information down below in case you're in need of a videographer in the Dallas area. So those are the setup tasks for the business. If that doesn't scare you off and go, ah, it's a lot to start a business, let me get to the next thing, which is this pinnacle moment early on. It's kind of intimidating to walk into a business and say, my name is so-and-so with this business and I wanted to visit with the owner about X, Y, and Z. It's intimidating. The first time this actually happened, I was in shorts and wearing a tank top, I think, and I had uh, driven out to purchase a used camera from someone. It actually ended up not working out. I had to return it to him. But I drove out to this business because he had me come to the business. It was an RV business. And I was sitting there uh, with him and he's a manager at this place. He's not the decision maker, so it wasn't super useful. But I started selling him and pitching him and said, now, have you guys ever thought about hiring a videographer? This, 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 and that. And essentially we sat there for about 45 minutes and I had done all this work with my business model. I had already figured out all the services I was gonna offer. I had figured out some about my pricing and it was this first moment that I sat with a business owner and I pitched him. Now, looking back, I didn't do an exceptionally good job of pitching him, but it was such a pinnacle moment because when I walked out of there, I was so bolstered with confidence going, I was able to talk with a business owner. We were able to go back and forth. I was able to answer his questions. And so if you're nervous about having that first moment where you, you pitch someone on your business, I would recommend driving an hour away and just walking into a small business or two or three and pitching them, knowing this is probably further away than I'm gonna be working. <laughs> so I'm just gonna cold run it. I'm running it cold. And uh, that was such an important moment for me. Even as I was driving home from there, I was calling my dad and I was just like, I had my first moment pitching someone and it was awesome. And um, gee, even just thinking about it now, it's a special memory. So that's just a fun story. Okay, number four, I started prospecting. Let me just share the bulk numbers with you here. I walked into 300 or so businesses. That's a conservative estimate. I set 40 second meetings. That's an exact, that's not an estimate. I went into my calendar and I actually counted. So I set 40 second meetings. I shot with 13 businesses doing free videos. And I'll explain that more in a moment. I also created somewhere around 16 proposals for different businesses. For the 13 businesses I shot video, I paired that up with when I was coming back in to give them the video. I said, I'll bring some proposals when I come back. And then I had a few proposals that I gave without shooting free videos as well. I had six or seven businesses that I thought, man, such a good chance they're gonna hire me here. I really think it's gonna happen. And those six to seven businesses ended up choosing not to do business at this time, except for one of them. One business decided to hire me for a 12 month retainer. It was a four credit retainer and it was a $2,000 a month retainer. So that's what it took to get to my first client. 300 walk-ins, 40 second meetings, 13 free videos, 16 proposals, six to seven businesses that I thought, man, they're really gonna go with me. And then one business owner who decided to hire me, sign a contract and begin auto pay. So I think that's just such a great illustration of, you know, you start out here and that's just the reality of doing business is you have to get your name in front of so many people before one of them sees the value and they decide to hire you.
Now, at this point, I should just zoom back. I think that if I was willing to lie, if I was willing to be really pushy, use really slimy sales tactics, it probably would have been possible to secure an additional or maybe even two or three additional retainer contracts over the past month. There were business owners that I probably could have tried to twist their arm. I probably could have tried to lie and say, oh, you're going to get way more money for sure if you hire me than you will be spending. Um, but I am unwilling to do that. My business, I want it to be founded on honesty. And so when I walk into a business and I genuinely think that my services will not be able to help them, I tell them that. And I say, what you're telling me, I don't think you should hire me. Genuinely. I, I'm not just like saying that and trying to reverse psychology you. I don't think it makes sense for your business. But other times when I walk in and I'm going, this makes a lot of sense in my mind. I think this is a good match. I'm telling them that. So if I'd been willing to lie and, and cheat and uh, be manipulative, I feel like I probably could have landed another client or two, but at what cost? I want to run this business and, and have a trust built up with my clients that I'm working with. And so I decided from the offset, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to be a slimy salesman. I'm not going to be like a car dealership. I am going to genuinely try to help businesses and sell them the things that they actually need. Now, there's a handful of things that I've learned from doing prospecting. The first thing is it is so helpful to walk into businesses with a cinema camera in hand. When I walk in and I'm holding my rigged out camera, the business owner immediately looks at it and then looks at me and says, can I help you? They're curious. What am I there for? The cinema camera helps pique that curiosity. When I walk into businesses carrying that camera, it just seems like they're so much more likely and willing to talk to me. I've tried doing both, walking in without and walking in with. Right now, walking in with that camera seems to be my sort of lucky charm as I'm doing prospecting. It's helped me get a lot of second meetings. It's helped me get into the door with a lot of business owners or past the gatekeeper. The second thing, like I mentioned before, is make sure to get business cards earlier on. It's probably 80 to 100 of the businesses that I walked into where I didn't even have a business card to give them. I had to write down my information for them like a weirdo. And so make sure to get business cards earlier on than I did. Restaurant businesses almost never have their owner at the restaurant. So I've just completely stopped trying to walk into restaurants unless it's an upscale restaurant. It's just not likely to meet the owner. Pet grooming businesses almost never need growth. Every single one I've walked into has said, I'm more busy than I can handle. I have more appointments that I can handle. We're booked four months out. Thanks, but no thanks. And they're so busy, they're so frantic, uh, it just, it never seems to work out with them. You have to be consistently adding knowledge and learning things as you go. You can't get to a place where you have all of that worked out before you start your business. You're gonna get some of it worked out and at some point you just have to jump and you have to launch and be aware, you're gonna have to dedicate a certain amount of time each week to learning the things you need to know to do the things that you're planning to do. So just be prepared for that. And finally, awkward things are gonna happen. I can count several times that I walked into businesses and it was just an awkward interaction or I said kind of the wrong thing in the moment or I paused too long or stuttered or said the wrong word or insulted one of their <laughs> clientele. And so those sorts of things are gonna happen. You have to have the attitude that you are seeking out failure and you are pushing past it and you are gonna laugh it off as you walk out of those businesses. And you're not just gonna cringe all day and let it get you into a state of, of being you know, shy. You have to pay forward and ahead. Now, one important thing is that I set up my business to be more a sales business than even a media business. Although the media is there, and if it wasn't there, setting up a sales business would not work. The excellence in the media is there, otherwise a sales business wouldn't work. I decided I'm not just gonna artificially drop and lower my prices to fill up my schedule and make you know a few thousand dollars each month. Instead, I would rather walk into 300 businesses and get down to one business that actually hires me at the price that I think I'm truly worth. And so that's what I did and I'm gonna continue to do. I'm not gonna artificially lower my prices to just fill up my calendar with tons of work. I would rather be making new connections with business owners and trying to find those ones that see the value and are willing to pay the price for it. Now, let me tell you about the contract that I got. As I already shared, uh, it was a $2,000 a month, 12 month contract. So it was with a house remodeling and house renovation business. They do everything within that 
sector. We scheduled the first shoot. It was about a week and a half ago. It went super well. That shoot lasted three and a half hours, including the setup and teardown. I actually set up a fake podcast space. I'll show you just some of those videos. And then we also went and shot some behind the scenes of them doing a job. And from all that footage, I sat down and I edited. And it took me, you know, four or so hours to do all the editing. And I cut 32 videos. Now their contract is 15 shorts per month to their social media. And so I actually completed far more than one month of work. The extra videos I'm staggering out over the next six months or so. You know, the total amount of time to service this client, because I'm keeping track of that, was 10 and a half hours this month. It took me 10 and a half hours. That includes driving, that includes loading gear, that includes setting up, shooting, editing. It includes anything that was related to working with this client. Now, where I'm aiming for these contracts to get to is a four to eight hour per month time allotment. I wanna be able to service this level of contract in about that amount of time. Four hours is significantly more profitable. I think I'm gonna to have to get more efficient, more skilled at what I'm doing, develop better and more efficient processes to get there. At this point, I think six to eight is realistic for me, but that's kind of the time allotment I'm aiming for. So you're thinking, you know, $2,000, 10 and a half hours, um, are you ripping off the business owner? The answer is no. And let me kind of explain and justify that. There's a few options that they could get the same thing that they got by hiring me. And the first one is that they could learn how to do it themselves. After all, I learned how to do it myself. So they could go onto YouTube and search tutorials and shop for gear and purchase this camera over these other 16 competitors and you know buy this lens and that lens and get all the rigging equipment and then research how to do lighting, research how to do audio, research how to edit, pick which software to use for editing. I mean, the list goes on and on and on and on of things that they could learn how to do themselves, but they don't have time for that. They don't have time to learn all the skills that I've learned over the last few years, the last 10 years to be more specific. In addition, the equipment is expensive. This month alone, $7,000 on equipment. And if I tallied up the total cost of all my equipment, it'd probably be closer to 15 or $20,000. So that's really expensive, not just with money, but with time as well. And so that doesn't make any sense for them to go that route. The second thing that they could do is hire someone who has a lot less experience and charges a lot less than I do. Now, are there gonna be issues with that? Yeah, the quality's not gonna be the same. It's gonna be a lot less convenient working with them because they're not gonna be able to do a three and a half hour shoot to get the material that I'm able to get in that amount of time. So it's gonna actually take more time for the business owner as well. And in addition, that person who is doing that at a lower rate is also gonna be taking more time. And so they're not gonna be able to have the speed and turnaround that I'm able to have where it was literally just a couple days later that we began posting after doing the shoot for this business. So there's trade-offs for that. It's something you can do if you're willing to risk the quality. If you're willing to risk more time being spent, you can go with a more low shelf option. And I say that to business owners. I say, you can probably you know, find a college student who saved up enough money to buy a $500 camera and you could try to make it work with them. Is it gonna work out for you well? I don't think so, but you're welcome to try that out. And then finally, you could hire someone else like me who does have the experience to offer what I offer because there are other people out there who do that and people at higher levels than I'm at. But they charge more. And so I looked at pricing in the area and there's another business that's doing this sort of work in the towns that I'm working in. And they're offering a third of what I'm offering at the price that I'm offering it at. So where I'm doing a 12 video retainer at $2,000 a month. They're doing a four video retainer at $2,000 a month. So all of those things come together to say, I'm not ripping off the business owner. And I think that it is a good value if the business owner can wrap their head around how valuable social media can be for a business. So that's what that's looked like. Now, the final thing that I want to talk about is you have to set up your business to play to your strengths. My background, if you check on this channel, 
is making thousands and thousands of hours worth of videos. I posted something like 300 videos over the course of a handful of years, and it was vlog style content. So I got very used to moving quickly from shot to shot, planning it out very fast, generating lots and lots of ideas for videos, executing those ideas very quickly, and moving on to the next project. And all of that honed me as a certain style of videographer, a run and gun videographer. I'm able to work within time constraints. I'm able to work within creativity restraints where other people run out of ideas. I can continue listing ideas for days. And so my strengths in videography are what I'm playing to in my business. Now, I also have weaknesses in my skill set as well. I never use lighting, so I'm having to learn for the first time how to use actual video lighting. I never really did pro audio. I always mounted a microphone just like this one onto the camera and just winged it. I never did more long form storytelling. And so all of these things are weaknesses. I structured my business though to play with my strengths. Other videographers would have to structure their business differently because they wouldn't be able to do 32 videos in 10 and a half hours of work. They might be able to do two or three videos in that amount of time. I did a lot of audio production and lots of music production, and so I'm playing to those strengths as well. I've, I've run podcasts before, and I know how to set those up, and I've recorded high-quality podcasts, and you know all these things come together to create a unique skill set. In addition, I've been working specifically with speaking. I've done tons of speaking. YouTube is actually kind of how I began honing that skill, just talking to the camera a lot. But then I've been a pastor for the last seven years, and I've done lots of sermons. I've done lots of teaching, hundreds and hundreds of lessons and teaching. And so I'm able to speak. I'm good with my person skills. And so structuring a more sales-forward business where I'm walking into tons of businesses, I'm making tons of connections with people, that makes a lot of sense for my strengths. But if you're an introverted person, if you're not someone who's able to go outside of their comfort zone, if you don't do well talking to new people, if you're not good at selling yourself, you would have to set up a business model differently. Maybe it's a website that you're actually running ads for and you're driving people to that website and you're using that to secure your leads. There's lots of ways to structure a business and I've structured my business as best as I can to play to my strengths, to minimize the weaknesses, the appearance of the weaknesses, and then to provide space for me to hone those weaknesses and turn them into not as significant of weaknesses and continue to hone the strengths and turn them into bigger strengths. So I encourage you, if you're thinking about starting a business, to do that same very thing. Create the business to play to your strengths and to minimize your weaknesses. I hope this video has been helpful for you. I hope that it is encouraging to you. And really that's what I want it to do. If you're thinking about starting a business, whether it's videography or something else, just know you can make the jump. There's gonna be a lot of steps involved. You're gonna have to calculate your finances like my wife and I did to see if it's feasible for you to do, but it's possible for you to do. I am a living testament to that because within one month I secured half of the income that I need to survive according to my living expenses spreadsheet. So I hope you're encouraged today. Thanks for taking the time to watch this. If you made it this far, comment down below that you made it to the end of the video so that I can heart that comment and pin it at the top. Thanks for watching. Bye.